My name is John Newsom. After university, I joined the Army and spent 24 years in the Royal Engineers. I'm a member of the Institution of Civil Engineers and a Chartered Engineer. Construction has always taken place in warfare, from Roman fortresses to Hadrian's Wall to Norman castles, medieval castles, and even during the trenches in the First World War. Military engineers play a similar role to civil engineers, where civil engineers provide infrastructure for the civilian population and enable them to live. Military engineers help the armed forces live, move and fight. Military engineering projects are sometimes key to winning a conflict, so they have to be simple and quick to construct. I'm at the Royal Engineers Museum at Chatham and I want to talk about two of the greatest military engineering projects ever undertaken. They couldn't have been completed without the combined efforts of military and civil engineers, many of whom had joined up to serve in the forces during the Second World War, but also the engineering and construction companies supporting the war effort. During the Second World War, the Germans had conquered most of Europe. In 1942, in preparation for the invasion, the Allies tried to capture the port of Dieppe. It was very heavily defended and the Allies took terrible casualties, but they did learn an awful lot of lessons. After Dieppe, the Germans knew that the Allies had to capture a port to land all the men, equipment and material needed to support the invasion. The Germans had got all the port and harbours under control and they were heavily defended. If the Allies couldn't capture a port, they would have to take one with them. A floating harbour gave the Allies the element of surprise. The Germans didn't know where they were going to go and therefore they had a wider choice of invasion beaches. Although the idea was simple, to create a sheltered deep water port where ocean going merchant ships could come up against floating piers and jetties that went up and down with the tide and be unloaded quickly, in reality the solutions were much more complicated, involved vast quantities of resourcing and were groundbreaking in terms of technology. The Allies decided to create two harbours for the invasion of Normandy, one for the Americans and one for the British and Canadians at Aramanche. The biggest component of the harbours were the concrete tanks or caissons, codenamed Felix. These were designed by civil engineers to float and to be towed across the channel where they could be sunk in place to form a breakwater. This was to be reinforced by the British with 74 block ships on the outer edge. Once they were complete, they were towed into harbours and rivers where they were sunk so that they couldn't float away and it prevented the Germans seeing what was happening. The pontoons, pier heads and roadways were extremely complicated. There were 16 kilometres of roadway supported on pontoons codenamed Beetles. The roadways had to twist and were designed with spherical bearings and had to be tested extensively to make sure that they would survive. D-Day took place on the morning of June the 6th, 1944. In the afternoon, sections of harbour weighing 1.5 million tonnes and towed by 170 tugs departed the UK and set sail for Normandy. The first caisson was sunk on the 9th of June. Six days later, a further 114 caissons had been sunk, creating a breakwater some five miles long and enclosing an area the size of Dover Harbour. By the 18th of June, two pier heads and four piers were operational. On the 19th of June, the worst storm to hit the Normandy coast in 40 years destroyed the American harbour at Omaha Beach and badly damaged the British harbour. The British harbour, however, was able to be repaired and lasted for a further six months. It was used to unload 2.5 million men, 500,000 vehicles and 4 million tonnes of supplies. The harbour made a vital contribution to the liberation of Europe and the end of the war. This brings me on to the second project. Getting the men, equipment and vehicles ashore was all very well, but to advance the forces needed vast amounts of fuel. Conventional ship-to-shore technology would have been vulnerable to air attack and meant that the tankers weren't available to bring fuel from the United States to the United Kingdom. To combat this then, they came up with a project codenamed Pluto, or Pipelines Under the Ocean. Laying a traditional pipeline was slow. The head of the project spoke to the chief engineer of the Anglo-Iranian oil company, who suggested using submarine cable technology, but taking the central conductors out, thereby creating a pipe. This would be a flexible solution that would be much faster to lay. The lead pipe was produced in 40 mile lengths, weighing 2,000 tonnes. The pipe had to be filled with water at all times to prevent it crushing under its own weight. Existing cable laying ships weren't sufficiently big and had to be modified. The pumping stations and terminals were located at Shanklin on the Isle of Wight and Dungeness in Kent. They were heavily disguised as garages, bungalows and even an ice cream parlour. The first pipeline laid from Shanklin across to Cherbourg took just 10 hours. By March 1945 the pipelines were delivering 5 million litres of fuel a day and in total 850 million litres of fuel were delivered to the end of the war. The Mulberry harbours and pipelines under the ocean 
enabled the Allied armies and air forces to maintain momentum and keep the advance going and shorten the war, saving lives on all sides. Without civil engineers, this would not have been possible. I'm passionate about military and civil engineering. Talk to your teachers, talk to your parents about becoming a civil engineer. Thank you.